Um, before we get started, I would like to remind you that I have a web page. I do not charge anyone anything. It is free for you to use. And this web page is specifically designed to make my publications available for my students and for those who are interested. So please, those who have not visited so far, and I do not count clicks or numbers of visits, and uh, there is nothing uh, that needs promotion, it is for you to use this uh, website. And for articles uh, that I have uh, published, some of them, for instance, op-eds. If you want to read some examples of op-eds, my op-eds are available here, like this one, this one, this one, and this one. There are others. Th these are, I think, all four of them from Bitter Lemons International that I mentioned earlier. So if you just go to the original website of Bitter Lemons International, you can read many more op-eds, and these are good examples. And there are some articles here. For instance, one of your friends just uh, during the break discussed with me uh, Iranian issues, and I asked her if she had a chance to read my articles on Iran. She said no, because she had never visited my website. There are basically uh, three major articles here published in world's uh, leading journals. And it's not an easy thing to get them published there, so please go ahead and have a look at them. Anyway, we will use much of uh, this information in the coming weeks. So the more you read and the better for you, but if you don't read, if you don't want to learn things, this is uh, up to you, it's your choice. There are also some articles in Turkish here for those uh, who believe might learn things. I mean, these are pieces published in the, in the past late 90s, early 2000s. And there are also some uh, interviews, lengthy interviews. I put their sort of uh, transcripts here, interested. There are also PowerPoints, uh, some of which we will use here in the class. Uh, like, uh, for instance, yeah, this one, the positions of major players in the Iranian nuclear puzzle. We will talk about Turkish-Israeli relations as part of uh, the Middle East security issues and things like that. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> pictures, two of them. Well, two most important pictures which reflect my standing as to where I stand in academia, arms control disarmament. <laughs> well, this is the point where uh, the Hiroshima bomb was dropped, hopefully when I was not there. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Well, this is actually right next to this place. There is a big convention center. And this building that you can see at the back is one which survived this, that blast, well, m miraculously. And this one, I mean, this, this is what, that was in July 2005, the 60th anniversary of uh, the commemoration, actually, of, the, of that tragic incident. And this is, if I'm not mistaken, a sculpture which was a product of a Soviet artist, but I might be wrong. I apologize in advance if this is wrong, but that was right across the uh, United Nations building. And if you see the nozzle here, it, it cannot be used, which reflects my disarmament sort of side. So I'm against all sorts of armament and all sorts of eye, uh, arms. What I hated during my military service was to carry and also shoot, <laughs> but of course, you have to do as part of your duties uh, when you are in the service. All right, um, let's turn this off and go back to our PowerPoint here. Um, you know, let's keep that way instead of having the full screen. We have seen two major developments in the, in the Middle East in the 70s, which had, of course, uh, repercussions for the rest of the uh, uh, sort of decades, actually, well into the 1990s, as we have seen Hafez al-Assad uh, to control in Syria, and Saddam Hussein eventually uh, came to power in Iraq. I mean, he was part of the power structure as early as the beginning of the 1970s, but in due course, he turned out to be the, the one man, actually the most powerful man um, in, in Iraq. So. Of course, there are certain commonalities between uh, Iraq and Syria in terms of leaderships. 
and the profile of leaders. One, one of this was, of course, um, the, a new elite coming to power, not from nobility, I mean, noble or aristocracy, noble families, nobility as the sort of uh, as a result of the dynasties or just the uh, Ottoman empires or British rule, French rule, who always sort of supported them to keep them in power in order to keep their interest alive in these countries. But with these interventions of the military on both sides, Iraq and Syria, we see um, Saddam Hussein and Hafez al-Assad coming to power in Iraq and Syria respectively. And around whom there was this in their close entourage uh, and also in the uh, uh, sort of hierarchy of the state structure from top to bottom, pretty much uh, with few exceptions though, uh, we see a new elite, uh, if at all an elite in, in some respects, uh, uh, from the rural area. And of course, uh, in, in both cases, again, uh, because they uh, seized power with uh, military power, I mean, they seized the political power, their political status, uh, thanks to their uh, military power, they stood not necessarily on, on a large sort of popular support. On the contrary, they stood on a narrow base of popular support, which was, of course, something important. And we have seen the implications of this toward uh, uh, the end of their sort of uh, rules. As, and in, in Syria, yes, the uh, Assad family is still in power, but there are certain things that we will be discussing in terms of the uh, implications of this, you know, uh, standing on a, a narrow popular support. Again, uh, the ba Baathist party, the Baathist ideology, which was um, not necessarily uh, something that would be fully compatible with communist or socialist ideology. It was pan-Arab sort of ideology which aimed at sort of uh, uniting the entire Arab world. Uh, it, it had some common denominator with socialist you know, way of thinking, but still Baathist uh, regimes uh, we have seen in both countries uh, not necessarily going along very well. On the contrary, they were competing with one another. So that is important here. Again, another uh, common uh, denominator was that they both resented uh, the policies pursued by the United States and therefore allied themselves with the Soviet Union. And that was more so for practical reasons rather than ideological reasons. They were not necessarily in fond of socialist ideology. They were not sort of full with uh, communist uh, sort of thinking, but rather they found it practical for arming themselves and at a time when the Soviet Union was waiting on the fence to you know, uh, uh, get involved in regional politics by way of sending their advisors and uh, also providing a significant amount of uh, arms, weapons, uh, munitions to the uh, uh, regional countries. Um, of course, again, uh, even though they seem to be on the same side in terms of Arab-Israeli conflict to some extent, but Syria was, of course, naturally was heavily concerned with the situation in the Golan Heights. And uh, Iraq, again, naturally, because of its uh, geographical juxtaposition, I mean, uh, proximity, was more concerned with uh, Shia, uh, especially after the revolution. Uh, and um, that is, in the view of uh, many, uh, one of the principal reasons as to why soon after the Islamic Revolution, which took place in January, February 1979, and soon after that, uh, within uh, a matter of months, within less than a year, uh, Iraq launched an offensive against Iran with a view to taking advantage of the vulnerable situation that Iran uh, might have been going on. Uh, and, uh, sort of, uh, therefore, these are important uh, things to bear in mind. This, of course, uh, brings us, especially in the 70s, uh, to some major developments. Uh, the, the war that Ibrahim just mentioned in the first hour, uh, during which the United States had to, had, had, or was compelled to in, intervene. 
One major development whose consequences were far-reaching, as uh, you will see right now, the consequence of the Yom Kippur War, maybe it was you know, uh, the way it uh, sort of happened. Also, maybe it was, uh, or it came at a moment in history that also coincided with some other developments. Because um, one of the most important topics in Middle East security, as again we have discussed yesterday, we'll be discussing in the, um, for instance, to, uh, on Thursday this week, uh, all this sort of uh, in, in a conference that I will be participating. I mean, nuclearization of the region or, or, or the nuclear weapons, the spread of nuclear weapons in the world and more specifically in the Middle East. Uh, this subject has always been one of the most important issues. And within this context, Israeli nuclear weapons capability has always been discussed, debated, and you know, came to the fore uh, in political and sort of military sort of, um, uh, discussions and uh, fora, et cetera, et cetera. And now they also uh, uh, find their way to the statements made by uh, heads of state or government in various places. But one thing that we sort of uh, have to say at, at the beginning about Israel nuclear weapons capability is that nothing is 100% certain because of Israeli a deliberate policy of ambiguity. Ambiguity means lack of clarity or just uh, lack of precision or just uh, accuracy. And uh, Israel deliberately does neither acknowledge, I mean, does neither accept the presence, the existence of their, of its nuclear weapons uh, uh, capability, nor deny, or I mean, because there are some countries which, uh, even though they may have a certain capability, may very well say, no, we don't have it. So, uh, that, but in this case, Israel does neither acknowledge nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons in its arsenal. So uh, it is therefore uh, something uh, that makes uh, things rather sort of uh, difficult with respect to when for the first time Israel may have had or acquired this weapons capability. So of course there are certain ways of uh, making inferences into how and when and why or you know, uh, uh, in, in which or uh, manner or through what sort of uh, action they acquire this capability. And there are certain um, writings, one of which uh, I mentioned last time, uh, a book, uh, the title is Israel and the Bomb, authored, I mean, written by Avner Cohen. Uh, I think published by Columbia University or Princeton University, I forget it. Um, it's a thick one, and the author says, Avner says, it was actually thicker, but the publisher asked him to cut down certain parts. And he wrote that book based on a number of documents, archival stuff, information from uh, uh, the primary source information, whose accuracy or ver veracity cannot be contested, and also based on a number of interviews. Uh, with people who have witnessed those years. So as I mentioned briefly last time, uh, even before the state of Israel was proclaimed as an independent state uh, sort of uh, in 1948, approximately a year earlier, uh, Ben-Gurion um, and Shimon Peres were few of, uh, two of the very few people who have concurred upon the idea that Israel must have the absolute weapon. Absolute weapon or absolute power means, of course, nuclear weapons, because they had anticipated that they could not survive in such a hostile environment, and that the only thing that would deter their enemies would be uh, that weapons capability. And they have done this in a truly secret way, and especially uh, if you uh, read the uh, book by Cohen and some other pieces he published. And I think uh, either he's going to publish in Foreign Affairs next uh, issue or must have already been published. I couldn't follow as to a kind of summary of that decision. And because he says this is a secret that everybody knows. I mean, worst kept secret. Anyway, so what we see there is that 
especially uh, the French in the first place, I mean, Shimon Peres is sent to uh, France to organize or to mobilize the uh, Jewish French scientists as well as businessmen to contribute financially and scientifically in their capacities uh, to the uh, realization of nuclear bomb project. For instance, at some point, uh, of course, they decide to uh, build a, a, a secret reactor in the Negev desert, which is the southern part of Israel. A, a small uh, reactor, uh, which is called heavy water reactor, which produces a significant amount of plutonium in its waste. So if this small reactor, which actually cannot be very much significant in terms of generating large amounts of electricity, but rather producing significant amount of plutonium. And if this waste is reprocessed, and if the plutonium in the waste of the reactor after some operation time, then if that plutonium is reprocessed, it can be used directly in nuclear weapons. So this, the, both the construction as well as the operation of this reactor was uh, done in secret. But uh, at one point, especially during the Kennedy administration, we see that uh, maybe it was on purpose or just maybe because it was by accident, one of the U-2 flights, I mean U-2 uh, aircraft, uh, which were flying over this Sinai Peninsula to control the situation with respect to the emergency, uh, um, the peace between Israel and in Egypt, they detect certain construction in the desert. And of course, uh, the US administration asks from the Israeli administration to you know, provide some information. The whole story is long. I'm not going to go into detail. But eventually, Israel uh, tries or manages to keep this uh, secret. And since then, never ever acknowledge as to whether they have produced any nuclear weapons at all, or how many of them, or which size, I mean, in terms of yield, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, there are certain issues which uh, I gather, I mean, sort of when I think of about all of them, uh, my hunch is that they must have had this capability around the 67 war. Maybe not so much right during the war, maybe in its aftermath, but what is for sure, and we understand this from the deliberations within the Israeli cabinet, the Knesset, uh, that uh, because of the conduct of war itself in Yom Kippur, uh, because it was a surprise attack on the Yom Kippur day, which is a holy day, which is a uh, sacred day for the Jews and Arab nations took advantage of this situation or wanted to take advantage of the situation. And um, Egyptian and Syrian combined attack uh, put the Israelis in a very difficult situation. And they really uh, came to the point, to the brink of destruction. So this is the turning point in many respects. I mean, things that you have to bear in mind, you have to remember in the coming years that in the Knesset there are records showing or suggesting that some members of the Israeli parliament as, uh, propose as to when they will use their nuclear option because Israel developed, at least uh, as they say, and there are reasons to believe to some extent, I mean, uh, maybe at least in the past, to uh, uh, this weapons capability as a weapon of last resort. This is the way they, they, they identify it. A weapon of last resort means you do not necessarily have the ambition or desire to use at will just in order to advance some political goals, but rather to protect your utmost uh, sort of a valuable assets. That is, to prevent Israel from total destruction. And if they are going to be destroyed, they will resort to this weapons capability in order to prevent this. Or if they cannot prevent, they, of course, they would like to bring or take others uh, with them uh, towards a destruction. So this uh, weapon of last resort is, uh, is a weapon that Israelis believe
ultimately uh, uh, deters the enemies from attacking them. And uh, indeed, the 1973 war was the last major war between Arabs and Israelis. Well, there were uh, you know, instances in the Lebanon, in, in other parts, but we cannot, they cannot compare to 67, 48, or 73 wars. So therefore, maybe it was because of this anticipation or understanding or acknowledgement that Israel had that nuclear weapons capability, even though they do not accept or deny. So, but during the war, when things you know, uh, were not necessarily bright in, in military terms for the Israelis, and some parliamentarians are known for uh, making reference, references to their nuclear option, because Israelis do never use the term nuclear weapons. Uh, they always stay clear from the term weapon or nuclear weapons in this case. And uh, of course, things that have been, uh, that were discussed uh, in the Israeli parliament and in other circles within the state, and maybe in defense ministry, in general staff, uh, foreign ministry, prime minister, whatever, of course they were picked up by the Soviet Union. And remember, the Soviet Union were uh, Soviet Union was an ally of both uh, Iraq, Syria, and had also advanced relations with uh, uh, Egypt. So when they picked this up, I mean, when they sort of uh, get this intelligence that Israel might be going to resort to a nuclear option, that is, <laughs> using nuclear weapons against enemies, the Soviets sent a message to uh, Israel and warns them not to do so, not even think about it, and otherwise to, to be ready to suffer the consequences, which would be, of course, of course, Soviet retaliation to Israel against a possible Israeli nuclear attack on Syria and Egypt. So, and of course, once this uh, warning is issued by the Soviet Union, the United States could not stay aloof from this, could not uh, stay indifferent because of this close uh, very, very close relations between Israel and, uh, and the United States. So what the United States, of course, uh, in case the Soviets react to Israel, then the United States must react to Soviet Union. So that will bring the two superpowers against each other, and that will lead to a confrontation between the two superpowers, meaning maybe total annihilation. So and at, the, at the nuclear age, I mean, in the, in the 70s, well, there was uh, the talk of uh, detente, but still uh, relations were not so stable. After all, both sides had tens of thousands of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles and other type of uh, delivery vehicles in, in their arsenals. So therefore, the United States feels uh, the need or f uh, compelled to intervene and stop this from happening because uh, they have to stop Israel or prevent Israel from destruction so that Israel does not feel obliged to resort to nuclear weapons which would trigger the Soviet reaction which would in turn trigger the US reaction, retaliation. So therefore um, this is important to bear in mind and Kissinger who was of course who had some diplomatic skills, political sort of uh, skills and still a wise man uh, in, in many respects. And he just asks uh, f from Sadat just to uh, pause a little bit. I mean, yes, Amelie? You can follow where the U.S. comes in, the picture? during the war, during, during the Yom Kippur War. Yeah. And that's what I was just talking. Kissinger intervenes, asks for a couple of days from Egypt to halt, to I stop the war. The Soviet Union feel threatened by Israel if, if the conflict is between Israel and Syria? The Soviet Union does not feel threatened by Israel. The Soviet Union threatens Israel. I mean, because when the Syrian and Egyptian armies advance to such an extent that Israel feels like they are going to be destroyed in the hands of these two Arab nations. There is this talk within the Israeli cabinet as well as the, the parliament, of course in 
some circles as to why they keep their nuclear option because it was I mean nuclear weapons of Israel were at least reportedly I mean the way they presented to the world uh, produced to uh, protect ultimate deterrent against its enemies to save Israel from destruction and during the Yom Kippur war in the first uh, few days they came pretty close to the destruction in the hands of the two nations and then people now ask I mean if we have this nuclear option nuclear weapons when are we going to use them after destroy after being destroyed so why not why don't we use them against them to stop to uh, their advance and uh, or to sort of uh, expel them from the territories of which they so far uh, occupied the Arab nations and when Soviet Union gets this you know intelligence that Israel might be willing to use nuclear weapons against Syria and Egypt then issues that warning to Israel that they should not do that why? Uh, well why because the Soviet these are two allies if not in the very sense that the, the alliance that we have within NATO I mean there was no formal military pact between Soviet Union and Syria and Egypt but there were two countries which were close to the Soviet Union which uh, helped the Soviet Union to have a foothold in the region where there were too many Soviet advisors, military advisors, political advisors and a, a large number of uh, Soviet military uh, arms, uh, units, etc. So it was in the interest of the Soviet Union not to let Syria or Egypt back down from what they were doing. But they did not want, of course, to destroy Israel most possibly, as, because that was one uh, I mean, uh, reason why maybe they stopped Israel, France, and, 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 and Britain against Egypt. Well, so these political calculations, and if you are a superpower, you have super interests. So you have to look at the world politics from a different angle, uh, from a much wider angle, and therefore the Soviet Union uh, threatened Israel and said if you resort to your nuclear weapons then of course you will suffer the consequences because I will be retaliating to you. So uh, it, because the, as I said Syria in the first place was, a, was an ally of the Soviet Union at the time. Is this clear now? Alright thanks. And of course a Soviet uh, retaliation would trigger US reaction which would, after all, as a regional issue would therefore escalate into a global problem or at least a problem between the two superpowers which, would, uh, which had nuclear weapons and you never know. And remember the crisis of uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis back in October 62. So um, the United States intervened uh, well, during this two, or two days, I guess, uh, of break and help uh, fortifications, uh, help with, you know, uh, Israelis, uh, paratroopers were landed some munitions, uh, some other sort of uh, stuff were delivered to the Israelis. Anyway, and uh, a ceasefire was brokered between Arabs and Israelis. And thanks to the efforts of Kissinger and Gromyko. Gromyko was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union at the time. So um, the consequences again, I mean if you if you like you can read uh, as many books as you like about uh, the Yom Kippur War, there are many of them around, but what is important for us for the purpose of this course is again not only what were the causes but what are what were the consequences of the war, uh, the Yom Kippur War. The U.S. intervention was not at all welcomed by the Arab world, especially, for instance, Saudi Arabia uh, held the United States responsible for this result, which actually was something that maybe on the one hand saved Israel from destruction, but also led to a peace between Arabs and Israel. Well, of course, uh, definition of peace uh, must be made rather clearly as to what you understand from peace. Um, and therefore, not only the United States but also the Netherlands, because it's a close associate in many respects, especially with respect to some uh, 
um, overseas operations. The Netherlands has always been the foothold on the continent for the United States. Well, again, this has a large background. I'm not going to go into detail. But what is important is that uh, this, uh, this Saudi Arabia uh, boycotted um, oil sales to the United States and Netherlands and also put restrictions in the amounts that they were producing. So that was actually which eventually led to this uh, increase in uh, four times, four ta five times or so in, in, in a rather short span of time, within a year or so, uh, the oil prices were quadrupled, increased many, many times. And one major consequence of the Yom Kippur War was OPEC emerged as a, uh, as a big power, uh, which had uh, much control on the um, production of oil. And that was a time when, of course, especially European nations were caught off guard. Because in the 70s, I mean, late 60s, early 70s, we still see heavy industries. I mean, or in, in Germany, for instance, in Britain, in most of uh, Europe, Western Europe especially, which, however, were dependent on oil imports from the region, from, from the Middle East, uh, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly. So the increase in oil prices affected the uh, economies in the West, both in the United States and more so in, in Europe, because after all, the United States, yes, of course, it was badly affected from this increase in oil prices, but the United States has its own resources in uh, oil resources in Texas and other places, uh, Alaska or offshore, etc. But Western Europe was not at all uh, lucky in that sense, and therefore, the increase in oil prices affected the Western European capitals in terms of economic uh, sort of uh, consequences very much. And this, of course, uh, if, we, uh, if we look in more into this, we can see, for instance, um, Britain, the United Kingdom, uh, searching for uh, oil and gas reserves. So did Norway, for instance, in high seas. And one consequence of this, or one repercussion of this, was uh, the uh, acceleration of the negotiations in the Law of the Sea Convention, which was being debated for decades without any tangible results. But this issue had to be concluded because these ma uh, big powers or major countries in the world, in world politics, have figured out that there, uh, there was uh, too much uh, at stake with respect to the you know, oil reserves in high seas, and therefore they had to resolve this issue. Uh, and one consequence of this was the Law of the Sea Convention. Well, why am I talking about this? And if we talk about Turkish-Greek relations, we may see the implications of that because there is this issue of continental shelf, territorial waters between Turkey and, and Greece. Well, uh, Greece does not see this as a problem, but still an important issue which, of course, uh, have to do with the results of the Law of the Sea Convention because the Greek politicians found in themselves the right to uh, extend the territorial waters of Greece from 6 to 12 miles, as has been mentioned in the text of Law of the Sea Convention, Article 3, if I'm not mistaken. And this is something that may have far-reaching consequences between Turkey and Greece. Well, not nowadays. The climate is warm and getting warmer, but uh, until recently, and maybe even today, when uh, seen the issue and looked at the issue from the perspective of different institutions. So you see something that happened in the Middle East had far-reaching consequences for Western Europe and for Turkey and for other countries. So therefore, uh, security of these nations or security relations within a certain region uh, uh, may have direct or indirect consequences for your own security. Another um, important uh, consequence of the Yom Kippur War was the reconfirmation of the U.S.-Israeli special relationship. Well, this is, of course, 
something quite ex uh, obvious. I mean, when, United, uh, when Israel felt like they were coming to the brink of destruction in the hands of Arab nations, even though they may have had that option, uh, you know, the nuclear weapons capability that they could you know, uh, deter or save them from being totally destroyed, but would still call for a possible Soviet reaction. But, and the United States intervened in such a period, in, in such a time, swiftly, uh, without losing time. And there we see the, the merit and the power of diplomacy. And therefore, I suggest you read uh, Kissinger's book, where, I mean, in, in which they, he, he sort of uh, explains in detail, well, to the extent possible, uh, how he sort of intervened and why and what kind of sort of steps he took. Of course, another consequence which is uh, important is that the uh, changing course of Egyptian policy toward Israel. And as we will see, that of course had in turn consequences for Egypt itself. What we have seen here uh, in the post Yom Kippur War period, uh, after the peace was, that was brokered between uh, Egypt uh, and uh, Arabs and Israels, Israelis. Of course, the Kissingers, I mean, that was a ceasefire, not a peace. I mean, a ceasefire is something different than peace. Because a ceasefire is an interim measure. It is not the ultimate measure. It is not an ultimate solution. It is, I mean, when there is a kind of stalemate in, in, in the war, in the you know, skirmishes or fight, and you see none of the parties can advance even an inch, but the conduct of war itself caused nothing but more destruction and, of course, more loss of lives. So you say you put a halt to the situation, you, you freeze the situation, and you say, I mean, there is no need to fight anymore because we cannot advance our neither military objectives nor political objectives, and therefore let's stop for a while and seek solutions or uh, resolve our differences through political uh, ways and means rather than military ways and means. So a ceasefire is an interim solution which of course uh, can be based uh, on certain conditions and so long as the conditions are observed or are sort of up, are upheld, then the ceasefire uh, continues. But for instance, since 1953, uh, for more than half a century, like 57 years, there is ceasefire in effect in where? Where is this ceasefire since 1953? I gave the date, just you should remember. What happened in 1953? 53 was in 50, uh, Suez was in 56. 50 and 53, this three year war somewhere, not in the Middle East, let me give you that much. Korean, Korean. Korean War. In 1953, there was a ceasefire because the parties have seen that they could not you know, advance their uh, situation, neither po militarily nor politically, uh, from where they were at the moment. And there was a ceasefire stopping the war, putting a halt to war, to fightings. And since then, there is a ceasefire. But of course, what is important to keep in mind with respect to ceasefire is that it's a fragile situation. Sometimes you hear ceasefires in this or that war, and uh, maybe in Africa, in, in, uh, in South Asia or Pacific elsewhere, but the ceasefire may not even, or Latin America may not even live for hours because one of the parties might want to take advantage of the situation. But as is the case in the Korean War, the ceasefire you know, still persists. And it is something that depends on the political will of the parties. And it is something that is fragile, vulnerable, open to sort of manipulation. And what if one of the parties feels more uh, stronger than it, its previous position, at a time that may suit to its uh, expectations or when it may think it is more advantageous from its own perspective uh, on uh, sort of a, based on some um, arguments may sort of uh, uh, end the ceasefire 
and start uh, firing again. For instance, uh, can you think of any such situation where ceasefire was uh, said to be coming to an end because of such and such thing and paved the way to another war in more recent times like the 2003 war in Iraq? The US President Bush uh, declared, made a statement, and, uh, and during, in, in that statement or in some other uh, statements that he made, he made to the ceasefire, which I will be talking about in the coming weeks, which was brokered between Iraq and the coalition forces, and Kuwait, of course, in 1991, in April, with the United Nations Resolution 687. In, in, in its Article 33, it was indicated that it was a ceasefire between Iraq and Kuwait and the coalition force which liberated Kuwait from Iraqi occupation. So that ceasefire lasted from 91 to 2003 when U.S. President said, well, that's the end of it because Iraq violated the conditions of ceasefire. So it is something that is uh, quite um, politically as well as militarily uh, vulnerable, fragile. And what kind of consequences it may have or implications it may have for the relations between the parties may depend heavily on the political military situation uh, in, in different periods. So um, here again, going back to the uh, issue because of the ceasefire, I mean, there was no fighting. And he Kissinger and the United States wanted to take advantage of the situation that was achieved by the ceasefire. And especially they targeted on Egypt and more so on um, Anwar Sadat. And he was invited to, and there was this shuttle diplomacy between Cairo and Tel Aviv, and a Camp David meeting uh, started between Menahem Begin and Anwar Sadat of Israel and, and Egypt. And, and this sort of uh, uh, Camp David meeting brought peace, and this time formal peace and formal recognition of um, uh, Israel by Egypt. So an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty was signed in 1979, which of course established uh, the, the groundwork for further uh, uh, exploitation of the situation uh, within the Middle East uh, as a framework for peace in the Middle East. Of course, this had again within itself far-reaching consequences for both for the region and more specifically for Egypt. And one as you could ex uh, 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 expect, well, Egypt was expelled from the Arab League. The Arab League, remember, was found, founded in uh, March 1949 in Cairo, its headquarters being in Cairo, and the homeland of the Arab League expelled uh, Egypt from the Arab League. And of course, the headquarters were moved from um, Cairo to Tunis. And that might explain the reason why, you know, before he passed away and returned to Ramallah, uh, Yasser Arafat spent a number of years in Tunis, in Tunisia. I mean, maybe that was the reason why he chose that place. And, of course, not everybody opened arms uh, and invited uh, Arafat to stay there for a long period. Uh, again, uh, Egypt, the consequence for Egypt was dear was uh, quite significant because uh, oil-rich countries of the Gulf were subsidizing the, the war, in a sense, uh, by providing them either at no cost or at a very cheap uh, price uh, large, num large amounts of oil and gas. And Egypt is a, is a heavily populated country and not necessarily a rich country uh, in, in the region. Uh, which depended on, uh, of course, this, the subsidies as well as its workforce abroad because it has large population. Not only that, that there is not enough uh, employment in the country, but there is this poverty and therefore a number of Arab, uh, Egyptians have fled their country and gone to uh, different countries to work and send their revenues and uh, uh, which the Egyptian economy depended. But more importantly, this, once, once these subsidies were canceled, Egyptian economy suffered the consequences, which 
paved the way to assassination of uh, Anwar Sadat and, of course, coming to power of uh, Mubarak, who is still in power. Well, uh, well, in the Middle East, Hafez al-Assad was in power for nearly th three decades. So this is, sometimes people stay in power for a few days, if not hours, but sometimes for a few decades. Well, this is uh, one of the uh, characteristics of the Middle East. So um, I think we don't have much time to continue. I'll stop here, but please wait. Um, I'll meet you on Tuesday next week. In the meantime, go over the readings. You don't have to read every single sentence if you don't have much time. If you do, so fine. But at least familiarize yourselves with what is in the chapters and come to class having at least gone through this PowerPoint. And we'll speed up and we'll uh, sort of uh, discuss more contemporary issues uh, in the coming weeks. I hope to see you on Tuesday.